e ti telefono a casa. <ride> Welcome to another episode of Let's Rewatch, the show where we watch movies that we loved in our youth and see if they're actually still any good. I'm Nick. I'm Brett. I'm Sam. And I'm Ash. And we are joined by a guest. Her name is Paulina Lagudi. Welcome to the show. Hi. And Paulina, you are writer-director of an upcoming film, Mail Order Monster. I am, I am. Yes, I am. I actually uh, produced it as well. Oh, okay. The the yeah. big three. <laughs> the big three. Don't recommend all three. But <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a lot of hats to wear. So you haven't slept. How's your sleep cycle? <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's like non-existent <laughs> back then. Now I sleep like a baby, so it's all good. <laughs> so this the the movie's not out yet. Still in post production at this point. So it's out of post now, and we're actually going to be releasing it before the end of the year. So we're kind of in that stage where it's like finished post. We actually premiered it with our distribution company. Company at EFM in Berlin in February. It was a really fast turnaround, okay. actually. So we shot it in July 2017, finished it December 2017, signed wow. with our sales agent January, premiered in Berlin and EFM February, and then wow. we've screened at all the markets since, and then we're releasing it. Technically, I can't say like the release date until beginning of October, which is like only two weeks away now, but um, <laughs> yeah, before the end of the year, there's only so many months left. So yeah. Okay, and and so it'll be in festivals and stuff like that. Yeah, the fe- the one and only Portland Film Festival, which woot is the woot. one that we were like unexpected. Yeah, we weren't really planning on festivals, especially with family films. It's kind of like not always something that's necessary. But um, Portland is actually because it's running around like Halloween time. They're showcasing a lot of like monster based films. Mm. So ours being mail order monster, it kind of fit right in the program. So we should kind of like explain a little bit about what the movie's about. It it sounds to me, reading your description, that it's one of those like personal family stories built around cool sci-fi stuff. I don't know if I'm saying that accurately. Yeah, absolutely. Having not seen the movie yet. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. Um, It's kind of an ode to a lot of classic family films in the sense that you have the child who's either like lost a parent or lost someone close or has like a family trauma of some sort or a family issue obstacle. And this other, otherworldly figure, I should say, comes in and befriends them and ultimately teaches them a life lesson. So something that we see in, you know, E.T., Iron Giant, Super 8, you know, that's not old, but they have that, you know, very similar type of trajectory in the film and similar plot. Uh, What's different about this one is it's very, it's like female based. So it's taking a lot of those elements and giving a female story and it's pro step parent and pro blended family. So it's taking kind of a classic story and putting it in a modern family environment, so to speak. Um, And then we've incorporated a lot of comic book elements to it. So actually anything that has to do with the girls' flashbacks are comic book animations. So the movie's live action and comic book animation. That sounds great. Yeah, That's it's awesome. a lot of fun. That reminds me of the uh, the Oren Ishii backstory in Kill Bill. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Not exactly yeah. comic book, kind of more anime, but yeah, man, like that, that was powerful. I, I love that stuff. It's it's interesting because I'm I've been reading some scripts recently, and I've been finding that more and more where people are kind of blending, like what Kick Ass did. You know, yeah. kind of blending cool. that. Actually, the storyboard artist of Kick Ass did our animations, like oh, did wow. all the hand oh. the hand drawing for it. So they're real. I mean, really well done. Um, yeah. And our monster, which was also kind of like an ode to classic family movies, is com- it's not CGI like one little bit. Granted, we're also a teeny tiny indie film where like CGI is like oh wow <laughs> completely out of the question. But it was built by the season nine winner of Face Off, the special effects show. <gasps> wow, because cool. I saw your trailer and I totally thought it was CG because it yeah. looks oh, so good. amazing. <laughs> That's so amazing. amazing. Oh, good. I'm actually the voice of the monster. <clears throat> oh, so wow. Me and, me and Guillermo del Toro have a, a little similar thing going on with his shape of water <laughs> thing. I was like, yeah, you know, voice of the monster. I'll create My sound team did the most incredible job, which was kind of funny because it's like a lot of the times when you go to film markets and stuff before your movie's done and it's in post, they're like, hey, send us a rough cut, send us a rough cut. And I'm like kind of can't because if you see the rough cut, it just sounds like a, sque- a squeaky foam yeah. built monster. Like the monster's built out of foam. The whole thing weighed about like two pounds, except for the helmet, which was um, 
like fiberglass. Oh, so wow. all the weight was created in post. I'm like, you're going to watch this movie and be like, this is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Cause one character, like one of the main characters is entirely not developed and the voice wasn't there or anything like that. So it was, it's been a, it was a completely interesting first feature film process because it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to make my first feature film, this really contained, awesome indie drama or something that's just like, you know, what normal people do, which is don't work with kids. You know, <laughs> I worked with kids. I built a monster. I shot that's in Kentucky the in the middle of nowhere. Like it was, it was a lot. It was a lot, but it was good. So I guess the thing to do is Google mail order monster, which takes you straight to the website. And then you said yes. after October 2nd? Yeah, October 1st, October 2nd. It'll be up there the first week of October. So with with a movie like that that you've been working on, why would you choose to watch E.T.? <laughs> E.T. Oh, I brought I got a lot of inspiration from E.T., obviously. Did you? you know, yes. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah, it's, it's funny because when Ash and I were talking, I was I brought up originally the Iron Giant because we actually designed our monster with a little bit of inspiration from that. The monster's not that, but kind of the jaw and similar with the eyes, except our eyes are two different sizes. And we actually have a little mm. dent in the head like they do in Iron Giant. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No one will ever see that, but for us. Um, and, but with E.T., you know, it was another one of those where it was just like, I truly believe family films from our youth, for us and our youth, um, they were treated as like pretty emotionally intelligent films. And my frustration with a lot of family films today is that they became very two dimensional, you Mm -hmm. know, and which was a little annoying or they became very, you know, vanilla, very safe because everyone's like, I'm going to make the safe market family movie in order to sell it and became this like money thing. And I love family movies because I think it gives you a lot of color to play with a lot of different genres. You can, you know, kids are just so emotional. The music that you can use within them, the color schemes, you can play with this fantasy element, but bring that fantasy into the real world, you know, which is really, really fun. So I thought it was just a really, and I loved how E.T. did that as well. You know, it was just a very, realistically, a very grounded film with this otherworldly element in there that I feel like the reason it's so emotionally impactful is because of that. It's because like we identify with these characters and it's like we identify with this kid who, you know, doesn't really have a relationship with his dad, you know, and there's obviously the mom's like struggling. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And it's like a lot of people can identify with that kid and he's does some things where it's like, you know, not all good and not all bad. And the mom's not a terrible mom. She's just doing her best. And like, even the people that are essentially like the antagonists, really are coming from a place of just like, you know, fear. They're not like really bad people. You know what I mean? They're coming from mm-hmm. fear, like protecting, you know, the community and things like that. So I just, I loved that element about things. I think a lot of family films that I'd seen in the market, um, not really, I should say like encourage or approach that way of storytelling anymore. Yeah. We talk a lot on this podcast actually about how like the early nineties movies had this theme of treating kids like you know, almost like adults, like they yes. treating them like they're smarter than adults. Like Jumanji is one that we cite a lot where it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of about the kids in some ways being equally smart or smarter than adults. And that sort of fell out of fashion. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why, because I definitely agree with you. That always made me connect with the kids more. I think what happened was everything was about like being able to communicate with the generation. So everything was about being relevant and like all of just, you know, plugging in all of, you know, the hashtags and the memes. And it's like, you know, being able to communicate with the youth with all the slang and so much of it. Yeah, exactly. I remember when parents and the adults were considered like the dumb characters and the kids totally knew more and they connected. And also kids often had like an energy that expanded and like a sight that expanded what, adults could see. And that was something that you Mm -hmm. lost and was special about being a kid. And it almost encouraged that like childlike fantasy and the, and the childlike imagination, which now it's, there's no imagination. It's just, you know, about being cool and not being cool and being bullied. You know what I mean? All Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Totally. Yeah. And I think that's why shows like stranger things (laughs) have a huge appeal now is because it brings back that theme of like, these kids are smarter than everyone around them. They know what's going on. They know yep. what the bad adults are up to before, like, the police and everyone else. As, as we've, you know, we've talked about that theme many times, and for me, it's always been a story told from the point of view of the child. And E.T. is the template that I always refer to, because I think Peter Coyote's character in this movie defines that, 
you know, you don't even see his face through most of the movie because the the camera, both figurative, figuratively and literally, are on Elliot's level. Mm-hmm. And yep. that's the template, I think, of the thing we're talking about, which yeah. kind of makes this movie exactly what that thing is about. That's so. That's actually really uh, a great point about how you say how literally the camera is on his level too, because that's the point. I mean, even if you watch ET, you're like, it kind of it's a family movie, but really, I mean, it, it's PG thirteen, I think, or mm-hmm. is it PG or PG thirteen? Well, it's, it's 1984 where PG and R <laughs> oh, means something different. Yes, right. Today it would be PG thirteen, but it is PG. Yeah. You know, like I know even from when we were going through our ratings, I was like. Really? That's considered, you know, yeah. like parental Jaws, guidance on that? Jaws had boobies, and I think it was PG-13. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it was yeah. different at a certain it was period totally, of time. It was totally different. But point being is, I love that, how you recognize that, how it was, yeah, getting on the kids' level and really seeing the world from the kids' point of view and how that was something that we as an audience member get to be brought into and everything that the adults are experiencing isn't as good. You know, it was Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, that childlike quality, like, that's what we want to get back to Um, and not worry about growing up so fast. Like, growing up so fast is a bad thing, (laughs) where now I feel like every kid wants to be, you know, 25. You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, (laughs) now I tell the difference. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, like, family films are kind of just superhero movies, like... Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I or they're the the wacky character that babbles. Like, I know everybody loves the minions, but I got no time for the minions. It's yeah. just, yeah. it's it's goofiness without any particular, you yeah, know, and, and, inspiration. Uh, yes. You know? What well, I'm even thinking too about a lot of the family movies that I've seen because I did a lot of research before this, where I would just like go on iTunes and I'd look up what's what's family movies of 2016 or 17 or 15, mm. you know, like really recent because we all know the ones that we loved and so many of them were yeah they're either superhero movies or a dog talking or you know and just giving the kid advice or just being silly it was just uh essentially free willy <laughs> name your animal like over and over again I'm sorry are are we saying we don't like Beverly Hills Chihuahua uh, yeah. <laughs> it's well it's like yeah they Exactly. And they redo that template a million times and the dog does funny things, whatever. But then there's also the, like, not coming of age, but kids at school movie. And it's like, you know, the kids mm-hmm. that pose in front of the lockers and it's like, uh, I'm the sad kid that's not with the cool kids. And it's very just mm-hmm. about navigating that world, which they're, I think eighth grade did an incredible job and it's not a family movie. And, you know, that's a great way to do it. But those movies kind of get old after a while. And I think kids, you know, every generation is evolving and changing so fast. It's really hard to speak to that world in a film and have it actually mean something years later. You know what I mean? Even mm-hmm. as adult, where I watch E.T. as an adult and I watch it, I'm like, wow, that even affects me today. Yeah. Because it's mm-hmm. a timeless story. You know, it's not so about like the year right now and it's dated, you know? Yeah. And I think right, yeah. what's so great about those early like 90s, late 80s films is that they're family films and they really mean it. It's enjoyable for the parents and for the kids where I feel like a lot of family films now are geared to much younger audiences yes. and you know, like Pixar will throw in a couple jokes for the adults and that sort of thing, but it's not a broad range story that all ages can enjoy to its fullest potential. hundred percent agree. Yeah. Like, like this is a, these are probably bad examples, but like, like trolls or what was the Disney one with the Let It Go song? Moana, Frozen, Frozen. Frozen yeah. Oh, like, sorry. Of those really <laughs> what did you say? I said Moana. Oh. That's a different, different also good. Um, <laughs> see, Moana was better, but like yeah. neither of those other two films really had much for me as someone over the age of five. What you didn't like, <laughs> Baby Crack, the movie, aka Trolls. <laughs> No, yeah. yeah. Though I am excited to see uh, the Mbimbam brothers in Trolls too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I cannot believe that. Are they making like a Cars Five as well? Like I think they've made so many. Uh, there's too many of them. There's too many too Cars. Many cars yeah, yeah. I completely agree though about the the family films being for the whole family. That was a hundred percent a major driving like conscious force for this movie because we are talking about 
you know, blended families and step parents that really like the dad and the stepmom. It was really the whole point of it is to get like the whole family to have a conversation and for the kid to be like, oh, that's where my parents are coming from. They're not evil people. And have the parents say, oh, that's why she's acting like a little mean person. She's not like, she doesn't, she doesn't hate me. It's just my intent. She's not ready to hear what I'm saying. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? And everyone goes through. So, and again, yeah, that's the great thing about family movies is from, you know, the past is that they really brought in the whole family. So the whole family could relate to a different perspective and therefore create a really nice conversation. Um, instead of not that. (laughs) (laughs) So is it safe to say we've all seen this movie? Yes. Yes. I thought Sam hadn't. What? Have you seen it? Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Yeah. Every, I thought you hadn't. This movie. Sam's got oh. her alien fear, so she that seemed plausible. That's, that's yeah. You. The I can see that. No, for some reason, ET doesn't bother me. I think because I watched it as a really young kid. Like, oh. I re, I don't remember a time when I hadn't seen ET. Well, and we forced <laughs> aliens on you, so or yeah. alien. So at this point. Anything else should be a piece of cake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just don't make me watch Signs, please. Oh, don't. Oh. Please don't. Please don't. Oh. <laughs> the aliens in that are, like, way less scary than the aliens in Alien. Really? Uh, there's a jump scare in Signs that's the so aliens. scary. There's a moment. I feel like the E.T. Alien, too, is just, like, more looks just like a really wrinkly old man. Yeah. It's totally. very short. Like, it doesn't even... I mean, he's obviously an alien, but... <laughs> doesn't have like really it's not like the quiet place you know or yeah. quiet place aliens where they've got something really grotesque about them or like the aliens from alien it's just like this wrinkly old toddler baby man you know yeah. I mean? <laughs> and, and they do a really good job of giving him a personality and a character yeah. and he's yeah. very like bumbly and you know that's funny adorable. That it didn't scare you sam because this movie scared the living shit out of me as a child. Oh, 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 let me let me be fair to my younger self. It did not scare me until the weird guys in white suits came in. In the white suits? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. In fact, it really wasn't the alien. It was the people in white suits. Yeah. That was terrifying. Aren't yep. those the best monster movies where the scariest monster is the, is the people? Yes. Yeah. I could kind of say that about Stranger Things now, too, since we brought up that reference. But, like, the Mm. scariest... I mean, obviously, the scary monsters are super scary. But, like, even when you have the bad people that are, you know, that are harvesting, essentially, this, you know, what's it called? The upside down thing? Mm -hmm. Like, whenever they're in those, you know, hazmat-y, uniform-y type suits, I feel like those are always the scariest parts as well. Yeah. Yeah. The other movie that does it well is uh, Cloverfield. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Where they, you know, happen upon the the camp of people and they Mm -hmm. they take her aside and we see through like the canvas of them as she explodes. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So, Sam, since we're kind of on you, what do you expect and how long has it been? Oh, my gosh. I can't remember. Actually, okay, I think the last time I saw this was when I worked at DreamWorks, so it would have been like, I almost said five years, but no, that would have been like six or seven years ago, Um, and I had to watch it in Fast Forward to pull reference of Elliot. (laughs) Then you haven't seen it. (laughs) So I haven't haven't actually seen it, seen it, Yeah. all the way through, like, just to enjoy it in a really long time, but there's no way... This movie does not hold up. Mm. It's going to be amazing. Like, how could it not be? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. I know. I mean, like, yeah. the cinematography is great. Like, yeah. the character is great. The story totally is going to hold up. Yeah. Like, I love the music. Oh, the um, music. Oh. You know what I mean? Ugh, that music gets me every time. We started this <laughs> podcast with a rule that we were not going to watch movies that were obviously great. And oh. <laughs> it took us a few years to reel back on that rule. And we've, yeah, we've, I was going to say, I think you mentioned this movie specifically as one. Yeah. We're never going to. You were like that. Princess yeah. Bride, E.T. <laughs> <laughs> and Sam one time wanted to what? watch Ferris Bueller. And I'm just like, no. <laughs> but, but we've rolled back on that rule because it is more fun. But yeah. yeah. I, I, I understand that sentiment. I also have find I have a really hard time actually sitting down to watch movies that are blatantly bad. Mm. I think, I don't know if it's just like I 
I don't know what it is, but I have a, I get very angry or I'll have to have someone next to me. Like it's really hard in a theater, but I have to have someone next to me that I can just like hit and be like, uh, <laughs> and just like have commentary back and forth. So bad movies in a theater are just not a thing. So, so don't like, like Brett choose movies. Is Mystery Science Theater 3000 just like torture for you then? Just oh, like, I, oh, I've never seen it. Oh, it's all, that's the whole premise is they're oh, bad great. movies. <laughs> great. Great. Yeah, so then, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should do that. What are you expecting, Brett? Man, so <laughs> this Man. movie, it, you know what I remember more than the stuff that happens in this movie uh, is E.T. the Ride. You remember E.T. the Ride? No, no. where I was never that? never got oh. to go on it. It burnt down. It was yeah. uh, Universal Studios in uh, oh my Hollywood. God. You get to ride on the bike, and and it's and they they take you through like the whole like they rebuilt the whole set in a, in a soundstage, and you fly through it like you're in the movie. And uh, man, I, that's sad that that burnt down. Quote unquote. It's on basically accident. the same ride as the Simpsons ride, like as far as like the way it functions. Whoa, whoa, nah, no, no. <laughs> Simpsons ride just sits Uh-oh. still. Shut down. Simpsons no, I mean that there's a screen in front of you, and you're in something that makes it feel like you're moving, but you're like not. A, the oh, did, yeah, it's did, the same type of ride. Did Ash just ride. shatter Wait, your whole childhood no, no, experience? It was a whole like it was it was the part Ash, where it was like the tour. He really flew on a flying bike. Okay, <laughs> he was flying, dude. It was no. A whole I'm set. really telling you, you didn't. It was a screen. <laughs> it was a whole set. I don't sure. believe it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't I remember. Mean, Brett's right. been on the ride. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've heard several people describe it to me. Oh, wait, no, I'm thinking of the Back to the Future yeah, ride. Yeah, you are. That's the one I'm thinking <laughs> of. Yeah, you are. <laughs> I bet there's Did a, the I bet there's a YouTube. Did the burn down too? I don't know if it burnt down or if... I, I feel like there was probably like a smaller fire and they used that as an excuse to just tear down all the shit they and had. Swap they did. Someone else. Yeah. They super did. They're like, oh like no, multiple the rides. ET ride burnt down too. Like... Yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> I don't even think the uh, I don't even think the Back to the Future ride actually burned down because if you look at like a map of the park, it's it was so the Kong ride away. that caught on fire. Yeah, it's like super far away, and you're like, okay, I, okay. yeah. I was talking to one of the maintenance guys at Universal, and he said when that fire happened, he had left his truck down there when he went out on lunch or whatever. And he went to come back to try to get his truck. He could see it. He could see that his truck was okay with all of his stuff inside. And they said, no, sorry, it's all under insurance now. You're not getting your truck back. <laughs> truck's been destroyed. Uh, yeah, and they wow. told him his truck had been destroyed. He's like, it's right there. I can see it. <laughs> They're like, the money we can make from the insurance. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But, like, uh, by the way, if you're going to Universal for Horror Nights, Jurassic Park is closed. Uh, yep. Very disappointing. It closed uh, September, or yeah, it closed like two weeks ago. Yeah, and it'll oh, it'll yeah. rise again like pirates with exactly the same stuff, and then one really weird Chris Pratt like Muppet yeah. thing in there. <laughs> They're gonna scratch off "park" on the sign and write <laughs> "word" on top, "world" on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Brett, you're anticipating a. Uh, a theme park ride that doesn't exist. I think you'll probably be the most disappointed. I, I'm telling you, having having lived this movie, it's going to be rad. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I, I don't really have much to say as far as expectations myself, because I feel like I've said that my expectations many times <laughs> throughout this show, like this being the template for the movie that is told from the child's perspective. And I think Sam's right. Like, how could it possibly be bad? Uh, so I, I think it's going to be great. I, when, I got no question there. When was the last time you saw it? Um, the last time I saw it was when they put out the special edition, which I have never and will never see. Um, and, oh. and for what it's worth, tonight, I don't know which ones you guys oh, are watching, no, but I'm not watching have, the special edition. We have the, we have the original one. Oh, we do? Okay, and good. It was the around when Star God, Wars God, redid sure. their... Visual effects, and they did it to ET too, and Damn they can go it. fuck themselves. Why? Why? Um, so that would have been ten or fifteen years ago. Okay. So when that happened, of course, I watched the original. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I I think it's I think it's going to be great. You know, this didn't win the Oscar that year too. That was like the big <gasps> thing is Gandhi won the year that ET came out. 
Why does so the... tough when you have movies like two or three movies that are like super classics? Yeah, yeah. You know, okay, it didn't Everyone's win, like but Gandhi thing. did. I know, but what was really the one that like people are like the classic? Well, yeah, that's which one like, really like resonates ET. with me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly. like that article Brett read that said they shouldn't announce the uh, Oscar winner until years after to see which movie had the real staying power. <laughs> yeah. Like it should be the on like a vote. Yeah, like yeah. a five year delay because it there there is this magical thing that happens with time and movies. Totally. Like you yeah. remember them, they appreciate over time. They really sometimes. well, or 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 they don't, <laughs> or they don't. Which I guess is the whole deal with this podcast is like yeah i know unless the podcast has an episode on it and then all of a sudden like oh no 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 (laughs) it does not hold up five years later yeah but i mean for some movies it really does happen like they really do get better with time like i would argue princess bride 100 (laughs) percent. would you sam would you (laughs) would Would you make an argument for princess bride why wouldn't i it's my favorite movie what are you getting at (laughs) I'm just saying that you mention it every episode. I do not <laughs> mention it every... I might. I don't know. <laughs> it's certainly You possible. do. It's okay. It's that the be best nice movie. If the, uh, cut if the Oscars weren't completely political anyway. Oh, yeah. It's not, it's not like it really is based on the better film. <laughs> so, Ash, what do you expect? Uh, literally nothing except for that scene with the white men in the suits, or, or I guess the white suits. I don't know if they're white men. Oh, I yeah, don't they're, they're all white men and <laughs> probably are. It's 1982. Pro- yeah. Probably. Yeah. Um, I have not seen this since I was a kid. And when did it come out? 84. 82? 84? 82. 84. So definitely not when it came out because I was born in 88. 82. But I haven't seen it since then. And I just remember losing my shit at that scene. And I don't know if I've even ever seen the ending of this movie, Mm. to be quite honest Mm. with you. I've definitely, like, you know, we've all seen it, like, parodied a thousand times with the bike and, like, flying up. So, I mean, like, I've seen the clip, but I don't know if I've ever seen the end. That's not the the end. I want to say it's different in context, but who knows? Yeah, I haven't seen it all the way through. I really, that's all I remember is those two things. Like, I didn't even realize Drew Barrymore was in the movie until I think I was looking her up on IMDb recently. And I was like, wait, what? Like, like, what's Drew Barrymore done? Where'd she start? (laughs) E.T. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, like you all are saying like, oh, this is, you know, undeniably a good film. Like, I can't vouch for that (laughs) because I literally have no memory of this film. So. We will see. You are I mean, in that's for a great a treat. position yeah. to start from. Yes. yes. You know, I've always wanted the ability to erase the mind and watch these movies again. Well, uh, you you did start from that point with heavyweights. It's too bad it didn't work out for you, though. <laughs> yeah. Was this was that the same uh, sort of thing we went into? Um, oh God, not, uh, the whole thing just left my mind. When we went and saw that other uh, Close Encounters. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, and we were all kind of like, we don't really know what's what's going to happen because, like, I had seen it when I was, like, four maybe, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Well, this movie shares a lot of DNA with Close Encounters. Yeah, well, and- that was the whole thing is that Spielberg's writing was Close Encounters, but he didn't write E.T. He, like, co-wrote oh. E.T., I think. Mm. But Close Encounters was, like, his baby. Yeah. Mm. But, but yeah, th- if, you, if you're trying to think, what's the tone like? You know, you not completely like Close Encounters because Close Encounters is darker and more adult, but there's definitely some shared DNA there. Is E.T. Totally. the ants to Close Encounters is a bug's life? <laughs> oh. Okay. No, no, no. You're thinking of Mac and Me, <laughs> which is another brilliant film. All right. So, Paulina, what are you expecting out of this? I think we kind um, of have an idea. Yeah. I mean, I've seen it somewhat recently, kind of, I mean, a couple of years ago, but also I was looking at it from a completely different point of view. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I totally expect it to hold up. I, I think I do expect probably a little bit more cheesiness that I love about the classic family, you know, just like that good old cheesy kid humor, but I expect it to hold up for sure. I, I'd be interested to see now, like what details, because it's been a little bit more recent since I've seen it, like what details I pick up. I know I, it's so interesting. I have a friend of mine that recently told me that she knows Dee Wallace, who plays the mom. Mm. 
I know. And she like, D Wallace taught her how to do like, do you know what Reiki is? Like Reiki yes. meditation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. D is like this Reiki guru <laughs> now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And teaches people. And I never really paid attention to her character too, too much. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to just kind of like sit back and take the movie in again, since I haven't done that since I was a kid before I was like focused on so many, so many little details. So yeah. All right. Cool. Well, um, we didn't talk too much about the filmmakers and the cast. Um, you know, this of course is directed by Steven Spielberg. I think we talked about it quite a bit when we had Laura Haratunian on and we were like, we spun the wheel of Spielberg movies. Oh, Lauren Hart. Sorry. Lauren. Yeah. (laughs) Sorry, Lauren. Um, but yeah, we talked a lot about Spielberg in that episode and talked a little bit about this movie. Um, but yeah, Spielberg, Henry Thomas, Drew Barrymore, Peter Coyote, 1982. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna watch this film. Go grab a bag of Reese's Pieces. Check yeah. out the movie, and yeah. uh, when you're finished, uh, unpause the podcast and see how we all feel. Do 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 do. Come in like astronauts, mind you. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've forgotten you. about the astronaut PDA suits. I have a huge problem with that. <laughs> the There's so many things throughout where I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Is, is me one too. of your problems how heavy those suits are? Yes. And, and how you don't ridiculous. just walk around town. And they also just like, just all of a sudden infiltrate the house at all angles with their and arms zombie in a window. Like he's climbing through. Okay. Like we couldn't all use the front door. <laughs> yeah. And the first thing I thought was like, I was like, it's got to be a dream, right? Like this is just like uh. the kid's dream. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they like roll up with their like normal, like hazmat suits and shit. And I was like, so that, that wasn't a dream. No. No, it was that just was to be extra scary. <laughs> and they've been in the house before, but they decide to like, all right, everybody pull back from the house. <laughs> yeah. And then invade and make it a surprise. Yep. Yeah. Well, because well, they, they, they were in the house with the uh, alien scanner, too, and they obviously didn't pick up anything. Because E.T. wasn't in the house then, obviously. He was in I the thought woods. The whole, I thought the whole <laughs> shot with the cord in the bedroom was showing that they were finding stuff. Because didn't they? Well, bug that they the were house? searching. Yeah, yeah. I think I think they were like picking up on <laughs> I mean, something. I think the hazmat suits made it clear what their protocol was if they had found anything. Yeah. <laughs> but let's talk about that power cord because that is just this. It's a tiny little scene. They're searching for radiation, mm-hmm. but it gave it so much tension with a simple thing of an electrical cord stretching across the hallway and pinning that chair against the wall. Literal tension. Yeah. Yeah. I would never conceive of doing something like that. It's another moment in that film where I was like, what the fuck is happening? Because that room is not that big. (laughs) Yeah. Like, where is is that that cord going? (laughs) Well, they go into Elliot's Elliot's room, then they can go through the closet that links to Gertie's room. Okay, but still, right? it was a little, it was a sure. little silly. Oh, my so, yeah, there were a couple of those moments. I was also, <laughs> we were laughing because when the kids are riding the bikes, you know, in the final like bike chasing sequence, oh my god, yes. before they fly up, and then there's like the insert close up shot of like the shotgun being held by the cop, and we're like, a shotgun, like mm. <laughs> with kids? What? Who, yeah. Why are you good? You gonna shoot yeah. a kid with a shotgun? Like there was so, no. <laughs> It's just like, we're just going to use things, a shotgun. Spoilers. One of the things that they say in that they did in the special edition, and now I can't say about that scene because I won't watch the special edition, but they replace guns with walkie-talkies. Oof. Hilarious. Uh, There's a so lot of maybe guns. Maybe they just cut that shot out entirely. That would be better. Yeah, that's much but better. I, in Robot Chicken this past season... I hope it's been released. If not, I might be in trouble. But there's a really funny gag that they did where they call attention to how weird it is the cops have shotguns and the cops just start shooting down the kids and the aliens from the sky. (laughs) so dark. I I wonder if in the uh, special edition, if they swap out, like, E.T. straight up getting drunk and therefore the kid being (laughs) drunk in class. And I'm like, Yeah. yeah, this is a PG movie. This yeah, is, that would be this, hard to cut out. That would be like how they, you could never do that today. You could never. You, do it. 
You brought up the bikes and I thought you were going to mention what I thought was like another hilarious did not hold up moment for me was when it cuts to like the them doing tricks on the bikes and it's obviously full grown men. Yeah, I love oh, that. Yes. So yeah. obvious. <laughs> oh God. I know. But I think oh, that so that whole thing kind of supported this fascination with BMX dirt bike in people of my generation. Mm-hmm. Like mm. the kids were so into dirt bike BMX tracks. Interesting. Probably came from that, yeah. And when they all land in that perfect like one, two, three, four, like when they pull yeah. up before ET yep. goes off, I was like, oh yes, so great. They're so bad. Perfectly yep. choreographed. Yes. I want to be that fourteen-year-old kid. He's so yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Now, there were a few. Mo- there was also a great moment. I. Like, I don't know why we noticed it this time, but it's the very first time that Elliot brings E.T. into his bedroom and you see his table and there's straight up a Coke can poured and then Mm -hmm. like it's, it's glue. You see the, the liquid that's been poured, like the, the art, the art team placed, this liquid stays in the same spot. It's just like painted glue, poured out (laughs) Coke and like a glued down Coke bottle and we're like... It's a perfect puddle of soda I perfectly think, placed on that table. <laughs> I think that's a thing you that kids got at novelty shops, like fake oh. puke or fake dog poop. Uh, maybe, later, yeah. he was actually showing it to E.T., and he's like, this is Coke. You drink it. But he was holding it with that fake puddle attached to it. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah. know why I didn't like pick it up then. It's one of many things they didn't explain, but it was just but like just weird stuff a kid has in his yeah. room. You well, know? it's like one of those things when I first saw – when I, we watched it again and we're going in – and then Cooper, my fiance, he shot the film too. He was like, wait, that's just like straight up plastic there. And I was like, oh my God, yeah, yeah. I can't believe I never noticed that before. But that <laughs> makes sense. It would be like in a kid's room. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what it was, but there was definitely something I noticed of like, oh, I never knew that was that. And it's because I've never seen it in 4K on a big old TV mm-hmm. before. <laughs> I wonder if you guys, because again, I have no memory of this film. So this was like watching it for the first time for me. Did it, did it bother anybody else that all the nighttime exterior shots of their backyard, there's a cornfield behind them? I was <laughs> wondering in the day, where that there's like a fucking California cliff. Like, what is going on in this it makes, movie? It makes no sense for yeah. like the exteriors of the front of the house. Like, they, it doesn't match that it there would be a match corn. It doesn't match at all. Well, yeah. Don't, didn't we get this feeling that they're building this new housing development yeah. up against the forest? And like, but I wouldn't they said the coyotes are coming I'd in. Expect dirt like if you because it's the california hills you expect like yeah. dirt that goes up to the mountains but they've got like you know <laughs> midwest cornfields corn yeah, yeah people that are farming <laughs> you know what i mean yeah. that's funny that is funny but beautiful backdrops yeah. i mean the cornfields are brilliant you know and what the I mean? lighting oh my god all the, fo- the lighting about the amount of fog and like steam like when he's looking out his window when he's doing the kitchen dishes and all yes. of a sudden he's engulfed in steam from his sink and it's just like, like how, how big was that fog machine oh it yeah. was like big and in his face and i was like this child and it's this weird thing where i can like these are what 25 year old filmmakers they are geniuses oh yeah i can see the things that they're doing but they're still transparent yeah you know yeah i mean the the thing is like when you're the great thing about a movie like et is you know you suspend your disbelief like from the get-go you know what i mean you're in it at right from the get-go you're like oh these cute little animatronic weird aliens that are harvesting I guess they're agricultural aliens or something. Yeah, they're um, taking plant samples. Yeah, and then you've got, like, the great guys that, like, run up with their flashlights. And you're just like, cool, it's this kind of movie. So there's so many things over the years when I've watched it that I just kind of didn't notice. And this time, for some reason, when I was watching it, I was – these things just kind of came to the forefront. For some reason, they stood out. I was – I saw the movie making, if that makes sense. But I think that's what yeah. makes a Spielberg film a Spielberg film, you know? yeah. yeah. Yeah, the lighting was just so magical and and yeah. practical at the same time. Yeah. You know like like it's not it's it's lit cinematically but but all of it is very motivated. Um you yeah. Know, it's it's just like like even the tricks of like okay, we're going to put a little cloth over this lamp to create like a more moody setting and Yeah. Who did who did the lighting for this film? We didn't talk about the No. 
Seen it's actually funny because Cooper, because he's a, a DP when we were watching, he's like, Spielberg does the same lighting in every film. He'll do oh, yeah. like oh, the key light with, with like a nice hair light. He goes, it doesn't matter if it's a completely mm-hmm. dark room, which it's funny because it always feels very motivated because when they pull to the wides, like there will be a practical source that's giving yeah. the light. but. In the close-up, you're like, no way is that practical giving him mm-hmm. that much light. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like the lighting the is so great. On totally. his face, you know? And you're or like, like oh, when okay. he's in the backyard and he's like, you know, sleeping, you know, looking at the shed and he's got this, like, you know, these goggle, this goggle light, yeah. which you're like, mm-hmm. why would it just be on his eyes? It's beautiful and it's such a, you know, great shot. It, that's but one of my Kirk motor- accent light on the eyes. Yeah. It's like, what? Yeah. That's, where would this come from? That's like you my favorite I mean? Spielberg thing is like, he doesn't focus on like making everything hyper real. It's just like. It, it, real it, enough. The shot needs good light. It's got good light. Who cares where it's coming from? Like, yeah, I, I, I mean, that. there's which is, which is great. That's how it should be. Yeah. There's yeah. aliens. Like we can <laughs> yeah. suspend our disbelief. Like, uh, uh-uh, there's aliens, but that light is not 100 percent perfect. Well, like, there was no. only one lamp in that room. Yeah, <laughs> which is like why the whole like this is reality, Greg line is just so yeah. great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. this is reality, Greg. Yeah. I yes. love I love that like also there was this time in like the 80s and the 90s that DPs weren't afraid to like use red light you know like oh, you saw that about so that. much yeah and I love I, I love it in this film actually like I felt like me too there's some 80s like lost boys where you're just like okay why is the whole house red all of a sudden but this film like it felt kind of no- motivated by this like street lamp which like Again, where the fuck is that compared to, yeah. the out, you know, I think outside, because it but. felt like, because it felt sourcey, I think it worked. And because it was so singular, it gave it what I feel like is something that Stranger Things kind of pulls from as well, where it's mm-hmm. like that one light. It's not like how some shows now, it's like all of a sudden there's like a red background and you have to believe yeah. it's like street lights. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or so it's like green, very atmospheric. This was like that one beam and it made you feel like the red was a theme, you know, or it was like a motif throughout that meant something because it was like a singular source, yeah. um, which I loved that. I thought about that this time too. I was like, oh yeah, that use of red was pretty cool. So the how, cinema how dare you accuse Stranger Things of stealing anything from this movie? <laughs> I know. Yeah. I also said original. They, I did not know how much they stole until yeah. now. They literally like, stole wow. the actual child and made him Dustin in Stranger Things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> they really yeah. did. And the you know group of kids on bikes going down the street, oh, yeah. escaping police and hitting a police barricade, and then a magic thing happens well, to get them Well, I knew that one. Yeah, but like yeah. I didn't realize they straight up stole a character <laughs> isn't yeah. that so like modern 11 is things, et though? yeah <laughs> <laughs> like yeah the, the stranger things is like oh yeah the magic of that scene where the kids escape by flying but you know what like that's lame let's have them fucking flip the van yeah yeah, yeah. They're like instead <laughs> of them flying <laughs> yeah the yeah. car will fly yeah <laughs> because you know so, cgi and vfx now are a lot better <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. We were looking up uh, where they shot that because I'm like, this is California. I'm like, where are they getting these redwoods? I know. And so I, they went right? to the national park, and I guess they like because I thought most of it is shot on a stage, obviously, and so like they created a lot of you know the greenery and brought that into the studio. But they, yeah, they straight up went to like uh, one of the national parks and like shot up there. I wonder oh, if that wow. was like, like yeah. yeah, the the NorCal redwood forest because that yeah. is so I mean, cool. George Lucas probably still had the keys, so he's like, all right, yeah. go shoot him. Well, yeah, with yeah, how yeah. many Star Wars references? I'm sure he still had yeah. the keys. Oh, I was so this looking is Greedo up. and this is Boba Fett. <laughs> yeah, that was like so much uh, product placement. Also, <laughs> yeah. like they're straight up the fucking Yoda well, puppet well, walking down they the were street. Buddies. Like yeah, they, were, they all and work. they place they always place stuff from each other's films in each other's movies. Yeah, oh, but we yeah. have to admit, while it is product placement, it's also a hundred percent true to that experience. Totally. Yeah, yeah. That's what we that had at that time in the early eighties. That was all the toys we had. Yeah, I was. Mm-hmm. We didn't do an elephant in the room joke, but uh, man. Uh, star, did you you know Star Wars had the ET aliens in it? Remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the prequels. Yeah, yeah. They oh were like God, in the really? Alien Council. Yep. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Have you that guys Senate seen scene? the HBO Steven Spielberg documentary? No. I think it's it's a film. Yeah. It's amazing. I highly recommend it. Um, but they talk about how it was like 
Spielberg, uh, George Lucas, Martin Scorsese, and like a lot of the whole opening sequence of Star Wars, how they give the text, that wasn't Lucas's idea. It was like when they would all get together as a group and talk about their films and they were like, you need to put in a backstory so we know what the hell's going <laughs> on. looking at Lucas like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> yeah, they were like, you <laughs> need to kind of, like, we know what it is because you talk to us, but, like, no one gets this, you know what I mean? So, it's interesting because, like, George Lucas was on set and all, they were all on each other's sets, so it made sense why there was a lot of cross-contamination. My favorite story from that relationship is Star Wars and uh, Close Encounters were coming out at the same time. And both of them were like, our movies are not going to do any good. They both thought they were going to be dismal. So they gave each other 1% of the profits of each other's movies. That's pretty awesome. Spielberg is a millionaire just from Star Wars alone because he has 1% of the profits. Wow. Yeah, it sold He's for like million. $7 billion? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I don't He's remember the number, but it's an insane amount of money. Yeah. Just from his 1% of Star Wars. Jeez. He probably feels some ownership, though. They probably all feel some ownership on it being like, sure. yo, this would have bombed without our <laughs> suggestions. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, too, because like you could kind of make the argument that their films back then were better. And maybe it's because they were all keeping each other on their toes, maybe. Yeah, they talk know. about that. They say how, like, but also, too, it was one of those things where it was like, they were such disruptors with their films to what typically was being made at that time. And this is like, I think the seventies, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And think about it. It's like, you've got these young guys, you know, directors together. The community of them was so much smaller than today because there was no indie filmmaking without some sort of studio backing you. You know what yeah. I mean? Like yeah. it wasn't, you couldn't take your like, iPhone or buy yeah. a camera. It was low budget, 20 million. You know what I yeah. mean? So it was, <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's just like a different t when you have, I think those resources and it's much a smaller group and everything's so heightened and like your whole life is filmmaking. I mean, I, I think about it now and I'm like, I don't think those guys would have made it today. Hmm. Like if they were getting started today, it would have been so much harder. If you think about it, one, the competition's yeah. a lot har harder Two. Again, your budgets are so much smaller. I mean, I guess like, you know, the artistry is the artistry and, you know, you make do with what you got, but it was really funny. I mean, Spielberg's a genius, but it was super funny listening to the documentary because it was like, I mean, Spielberg got his start at 20 mm -hmm. on the, by, from Universal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like backed at 20 years old. That's you like not I mean? even yeah. out of film school. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. No. It was, was his backstory. Was he the one whose thing was like they <laughs> snuck onto the lot? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. But he made the short Amblin, right? And then what happened mm -hmm. was like he was essentially, I think he was like the youngest director ever signed to make, to have like just a, a set contract. And he was just making TV movies all the time hmm. on their lot. And so he had all this practice and he did this movie, Duel. And then from there, like, Jaws came along and stuff. But you think about it now, like, you hear about Jaws and, you know, they went so many days over and so much over budget. It's like, when would that ever happen today with, like, a first time, you know what I mean, director being given that? But it just is so, it's just such a different time. Yeah. yeah. Spoiled. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but at the same time, I could see him, like, having all of these resources from a young age and just being that much more prolific. You know, can totally. you can you imagine giving a Spielberg a camera like a decade yeah. earlier, like at the age of ten instead of twenty? Like, yeah, they would have adapted in different ways and been yeah. ingenious in different ways. Yeah, I think we have, and you know, I think we have those people now. It's just like the outlets are different. You know what I mean? Yeah, you know, everyone. You know, there's just so was, much more. I was gonna say, I feel like those people are actually YouTubers now. Like, mm -hmm. like the people who are making the things that are so wildly different are, are the YouTubers and the YouTube community and people like Freddie Wong. I don't know if you're familiar with rocket jump, but like, Oh yeah. The, yeah. The stuff they make is like at such a different level than other YouTubers, but it's also so fresh and different compared to stuff you see. Like they made video game high school, which was just a complete original fresh take, you yeah, know, even watching anime crimes division. <clears throat> I haven't been. I want to, though, because Lauren Lauren was telling me about how she was, like, location scouting for season two because she shot season two and one. 
but uh, yeah, I want to definitely. It's on my list, but you know, I feel like they're making the stuff that is the edgy stuff that Hollywood won't make right now, but like in, in like 10 years, like suddenly that's, I'm sure, you know, they'll see this success on YouTube and like, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's already kind of happened for rocket jump. They got a Hulu show. Yeah. I watched it. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I remember being like, Oh my God, this is awesome. I actually see one of their producers all the time. Like we go to the same cafes. I'm like, Oh my God. Oh really? That's a guy from rocket jump. He has no idea who I am, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Except that girl that's like looking away saying, that's the guy from rocket jump. Um, I should uh, introduce you to Lauren. She's the, one of their DPs. She's oh yeah, really awesome. absolutely. She's a friend. I of thought mine. it was cool. Yeah, I really like Rocket Jump a lot because you know, it's exactly what you're saying. Like they've created something really different, but they really are making things for their audience too. They understand mm-hmm. the platform, and so they understand the boundaries yeah. within it, and like they know how far they can push things. Versus if they were making things that they thought you know they wanted to go to series or HBO or Netflix, like this stuff wouldn't really the stuff that they're making wouldn't go that route. You know what I yeah. mean? I think the, they're trying to, uh, go that route, but I think they're like slowly building their way there. Yeah. You know, I yeah. Also see, they like, definitely built the a anime lot. crimes division is one of those things where it's like HBO. I don't think would do a show like that. Cause it's just yeah. like, it, it's so, so much of an in joke for so much. Like all the whole thing is like, if you've never seen anime, none of this really makes sense. <laughs> That's why I'm saying the mainstream needs to catch up. And I think it will because of YouTube eventually. And YouTube's got their up. series now. And then you've got Facebook making series and stuff. So it's opening up a lot of avenues for people to like, you know, mm-hmm. have like, like the rocket jumps to be like, yeah, we have our own show. We get paid all the time. Just like on, you know, a mainstream platform. I mean, what's funny is Netflix wasn't even considered mainstream for a while. Yeah. No, you it know, a and really so, long time. Yeah. yeah. Things evolve. And yeah, mm-hmm. that's the great thing. Like the rocket jumps and even like you think about the earlier YouTubers, like I always think of early Bo Burnham as being someone that's like so oh, yeah. genius, <laughs> you know, I think he's just a genius on what he does because of just to have the, like to just be so forward thinking with the platform of YouTube at the yeah. time. It's like, wow, that's, that really takes some, th- especially that young. Just put, you know what yeah, I mean? Putting mm-hmm. what out on, on YouTube is like, what is going on here? Yeah. And that, but that's like, it, 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 he just took off from there. Totally. Wow, I didn't that know that he started too. as a YouTuber. Oh, famous, famous oh, YouTuber. Wow. Yeah, and that was his thing. It's like, and he talks about now, which is why he created eighth grade, because he felt a lot of, um, he just really connected to that world, because that's where he started. And he was like, you know, YouTubers today have to at least post once a day. He goes, back when I was a YouTuber, it was like maybe once a week. Yeah. But at like the platform has, you know, and just because of the audience now, they demand so much more. I mean, I like, even, true. even the once a day thing has been really only since like 2016, 2017, before mm-hmm. that it was like recommended once a week. Um, and before that it was like, whenever you felt like it, you know, and it's definitely yep. accelerated to a point that unfortunately people like rocket jump it's hard to keep up with high production value. And so YouTube's really shifting to vloggers now, which is sad, but but I'm hoping that another outlet opens up for, you know, people. So let's talk about how, how much I love the older brother watching it this (gasps) time around. I made a note. Never registered with me as a child. The way he protects the mother, the way he is the responsible party while still being one of the kids. Totally. And I love the way that they first paint him as a bit of a jerk. Like, he's hanging out with his friends. He's got to be the cool brother. And then he quickly flips. Like, I think it just really resonates the whole idea of family. Because he, when he's with his friends and hanging out, he can be relaxed. But when it's important, he sticks up for his family. When his brother really needs him... He <laughs> dog tone. I know when his brother really needs him, you know, he's there for him and he helps him yeah. and he protects E.T. and his brother. And, you know, the, the smallest moment is when it flipped for me is when they all kind of stormed outside. Like, what did you see? What did you see? And everybody's making fun of Elliot. And just this tiny little line, he says, you know, the gate is open. 
Yeah. You know, so he was kind of looking out for Elliot, even in that tiny little moment. And I'm like, yeah. ooh, this guy's interesting. It's interesting because I think that's where, like, when we initially had the conversation before we watched the movie about, like, family films really were for the whole family. And it's interesting because that would be how it is when a dad is absent, the older yeah, brother would kind of fill job. in that role. But at the same time, he is still a kid. Yeah. You yeah. know, so and he had to play an interesting role of like, I'm still a kid that picks on his brother and like, you know, I have my own kid issues and I've got my friends, but I also know that there's a role here that I need to fill. Yeah. 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 But it wasn't, it didn't seem like an unhealthy way, you know, no. like the way they portrayed it was just like, very innocent and not like sort of an uncomfortable abusive family situation like you had mentioned earlier the mom is like doing the best she can but seriously doing a really great job you know she's supportive is she she doing the best she can she seems pretty clueless (laughs) when he's like sleeping in the forest on halloween (laughs) like she seems like the worst mom i think the only time it really gets out of hand is when she finds a beer can on the ground and is like he huh. did no reaction. Think. Yes, thank you, thank but you. He didn't like. She was, you know, she's genuinely like going through some hard times. It's not like on I, uh, Stranger Things it's... where like, oh the, yeah, just shitty eighties dad is just like, what's going on here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like I mean, I, she's still keeping it together. She's getting them to school on time. Like she's taking care of Elliot when he has his fake sickness. Like, it, you know, she's struggling, but keeping a pretty solid household. I think My, families were different back then too. Like, yeah. you know, even mm-hmm. when we're talking about the ratings, like this is a PG movie, but there's so many things in it where today it would be considered PG 13. And everyone always talks about how, you know, Oh, back then it's like kids, like we left the door unlocked and kids would just, you know, your parent, you just be like, Hey mom, I'm going out. And you just ride your bike. Stranger things they do. Yeah. They ride their mm-hmm. bike like miles away. I think it was one of those things where parents back then were less helicopter parents yeah. and they knew what was innocent, but they also, they really gave their kids a lot of space, especially a working mom was, yeah. you know, she wasn't that mom that was like, I need to have a talk with you. Are you on drugs? Are you going to end up in jail? You know what I mean? Cause she sees a beer can. I felt like a lot of the cheesy moments were given mm-hmm. to the adults. Yeah. And, and it's funny because it's like, okay, is that just, you know, is it directionally that way? Because he wanted to paint the picture of like, the kids know what's going on. The adults, yeah, you know, are the ones be. that mess it all up and they're the clue, clueless ones, specifically being the fact that it's like, okay, here's this alien that's on earth and the kids are able to keep it alive. And as soon as the adults get their hands on it, it dies, you know, or almost mm-hmm. dies, essentially. I mean, to be fair, he was dying before yeah. the adults. This is true. <laughs> and this and is true. I, I do want to talk about Peter Coyote, the, the, the guy with the keys, wh- yeah. whatever you call the character. His name is Keys. He's His name key is Keys. On the character list on IMDb. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but he is just such this genius, beautiful character. You know, there's there's that thing that I always talk about, you know, the point of view of the kids, and you never actually see his face <laughs> in the first half of the movie. And he's this threat. But when you do finally see him, you very quickly realize he's not a threat. He's, he is Elliot plus 25 years. Yeah. He is 100% on our side. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, like, and it's sobering. As a, yeah. as a kid, it always felt like they were against him, like against E.T., against Elliot. And then rewatching it now as an adult, seeing the scene where E.T. is dying – like, they're literally doing everything that's medically possible to try and save E.T., like, every logical step. You know, they're checking his blood pressure. They're giving him fluids. They're giving him <laughs> CPR. And Trying like, to figure out what his anatomy is. Yeah, and, and, like, it's really interesting as an adult because they care about him, which, as a kid, it felt like they didn't, which yeah. definitely adds to the situation and, like— really adds to the emotion like Elliot feels like they're mishandling him and being you know negligent and not listening to him mm-hmm. but they really are caring so it's it's interesting to see how those stereotypes uh, like character stereotypes bounce around through Hollywood over the decades and like <laughs> yeah. we're always talking about how how you know if things are evolving and 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 but like in this case, like the the parents that aren't paying attention and the government uh, just unilaterally always being evil. And like, you know, if that was a Today movie, they'd be dissecting the alien the first chance they got. Yeah. And yeah. like it's it, 
some of those didn't quite make it to, to today uh, without be without becoming worse stereotypes. Like this, this movie was awesome because there wasn't really a bad guy. There was nuance. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. people mm-hmm. shortcut with their homages and end up with these cliches. Yeah. What was that one? It was the South African alien movie. And like oh, District, District Nine. Nine. District, yeah, that's like kind of one where it's like, yeah, the government, you know, yeah. yeah, totally. The otherworldly thing is completely dissected and messed up, and all this other stuff, which is why I kind of liked Arrival too. I was gonna I say they, Arrival was oh, much better so with that. Good. Yeah, they yeah. they walked the that line a bit better, and yeah, I, I think this is why I loved ET so much, and like why I pulled so much of it for my movie as well, is because of like there was really, if you watch it as an adult, you're like, oh, there's really no good and evil. There's just perspectives and intentions yeah. and how they, they're yeah. taken the wrong way based on the different perspective the other person's coming from. But it's also funny how you talked about, like, Keyes' character. We, it's actually when we see his face and get to know him as a fully fleshed out character do we see that he's actually quite nice. And for some reason, the dog from Sandlot <laughs> popped in my head. Because I was yes. like, they kind of do yes. the same thing there. Yeah. You know? okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. if you think about it, he's really, like, caring about the whole situation. Like, he gives Elliot time alone to say goodbye to E.T. and, like, helps him when he's freaking out and, like... Like just really subtle, caring things that he I is, but he also like Elliot is like he needs to go home, and he's like, "Oh no, Elliot, we we can't do that. We need this is more. the most amazing <laughs> thing that's ever yeah. happened." You know, like yeah. he he was still not a hundred percent. Yeah, you know, he, yeah. he had other motives. He's probably realizing that, like, well, if this alien somehow ended up on earth and they're harvesting agriculture it's really because like fast forward these aliens are going to come back and like destroy earth and see if it's (laughs) habitable that's et part two yeah yeah Yeah, et's revenge yeah (laughs) but like the keys character found et's machine in the woods and didn't immediately turn it off yeah Yeah. he let it go and he he chose to find out what it was doing before he made an assumption and reacted. It was also mm-hmm. a fork and a saw blade and an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, no, I, well, yeah. So, there's, uh, so great. There's this thing that, that um, Hitchcock would talk about playing the audience like a musical instrument, you know, manipulating the audience with moments and, you know, things like that. And it's so genius that clearly your intent is to have a a, a movie theater full of children weeping that this alien has died and then closing the lid of the cooler and just you start to see the glow as the cooler closes. And it brings me to tears, this me idea too. of children in a theater going, Elliot, turn around. Look, look, look. Yeah. That is playing the audience like an instrument. And yep. it's just yeah. so masterful. And, and it's so masterful. still work today. Like I, I oh, didn't yeah. think that I would have that reaction. Like, before, when we were talking about it, I was like, oh, I got to tell the story about when I was a kid, how I'd always cry when I thought E.T. was dying. Ha <laughs> ha. And oh, then I cried I'm, this time. I, yeah. I was sitting there and I'm <gasps> like, oh, <Yeah>. wait, <laughs> it still hits yeah. me. Like, it's just a beautiful scene. Like, and you're right, like, hit every emotional note and like, predictably, everyone is reacting this way. Like, yeah. it's just masterful filmmaking right there. It and, feels very crafted, like, when I think yeah, about his yeah. films. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't push it, – it's so few words, but when they have those emotional moments, it's like everything kind of fits. It's like the music hit the right yeah. notes. Like, the lighting was right, and it's like, you know, the blocking was perfect, and you know what I mean? It's just that perfect it, little moment exactly. where it's like, okay, and cue it, because it just feels so crafted. You know what uh, I yeah. mean? Yeah, and it's so, but, like, magically balanced so that it doesn't yeah. feel forced. Like, yeah. the music doesn't come in over dramatically. like, and the acting isn't overacting, you know? Yeah, it's just, genuine. Yeah. That's interesting because I found it very predictable, so I didn't really have an emotional reaction to it. I will say it's predictable, yeah. but I still find it, like, I still find it, I have an emotional reaction to it, even though I know the emotional reaction's coming. That's why I feel like it's yeah. so crafted. Because yeah. it's like, oh, yeah, th- I know this is going to happen. I know how this story goes. And yet, because all of these things hit, 
you know, come together at the perfect time, this emotional reaction is just going to come. You know what I mean? Or it's like, even Mm -hmm. if I don't cry, it's like, I understand, wow, that's a heartfelt moment. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's easy for me to put myself in the mind of the seven-year-old. Oh yeah. And look at the intent of the movie and watching that as a seven-year-old who doesn't know the rules yet, who doesn't know that the filmmaker's not going to let you walk out of the theater with a dead alien. Yeah. You know, a child seeing that for the first time, it makes me want to watch the movie with a child. I, I still think it's yeah. buck wild that this is a kid's film. Because I know. <laughs> this shit is so scary. Like, even today, like, it starts out with the scary music and, like, oh, yeah. it's going to be a horror film. Like, it's a, se- okay. a seven-year-old child watching this, I can't even imagine. Yeah, like, but that's how I felt about Snow White, the cartoon version. Oh, yeah. Yes. I saw it. Yeah. I was like... Uh-huh so afraid it was very dark disney Mm -hmm. movie you know what i mean disney movie but i think that's also like i think it's good you know because i think those those fears like when you know kids like when myself as a kid like when you have those fears it ignites so much imagination yeah and and it makes them think and feel about what they're watching like it doesn't have to be all bubblegum candy fluff you know like yeah, yeah it, i'm just i'm just surprised that a seven-year-old wouldn't be terrified of this film is all because yeah. well, like even the yeah. moment that you were talking about bryce was watching the movie with me and he was like this is a kid's movie and i was like it's super fucked up right yeah, like, yeah. super <laughs> fucked up yeah well but like this is what i grew up on i would have yeah. been four years old and i don't know if i saw it immediately i probably saw it a little bit later but mm-hmm. yeah it worked yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah. that's that's what you know built my emotional intelligence yeah totally like that astronaut scene like yeah it's ridiculous it it is it's ridiculous but even as an adult that shit's scary can you fucking imagine if an astronaut walked through your front door like that like Nope, yeah. nope. I would nope out of there I, so fast. That's an impossible astronaut. The yeah. Snow build yeah. in that where they open the door and they just kind of all stop and stare for like, it must yeah. have been like five seconds. And you're yeah. just like, what are they yeah. staring at? No vocal reaction at all. It's just yeah. a stunned run to the next exit. Another one. Yeah. <laughs> then, no window. Yeah. After but it, it cuts I love to it. another scene, that moment would be like, hey, so uh, we're with the government. <laughs> yeah, yeah. See, yeah. I. I was laughing during that scene, too, because the mom's like, this is my house. And I'm just like, that's your reaction? It's just to scream, this is my house? I mean, but it really, like... like, like, yell at a space van in the doorway. It's so ridiculous. I know. That part cracks me up. It really does sell the point that, like, they're taking over their lives. Like, I thought it was a... Yeah, it was a really interesting choice that they kept all of that in the house. Well, yeah, yeah, like that's a, good, that's a yeah. polite way of saying it. Yeah, in in a movie now, they would just take the kids and the family to a government facility, and and it would completely change the feeling of the film. The fact that they chose to keep all of that in their house is really interesting for the tone of the film. Like it keeps wonder, it in a familiar place. I wonder if they were to like if you know if this were, movie were to be made today, I feel like they would have tried. If they were to try and make it more realistic, it would take it too far away from being a family film, I think. Yeah. I feel like it would be just way too scary because you've got these, like, straight-up home invasion mm-hmm. happening. Yeah. Intruders essentially going to, like, kidnap your little friend. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But isn't that a director doing their job? That yeah. r- regardless of what the topic is, the director should be setting a specific tone? And yep. mm-hmm. was very successful in that job. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think it's mostly, if you look at the three-act structure, the beginning of Act 3 should be in a new location, as it's called. And instead of going to a physical new location, they just made the house into a new location by yeah. making it invaded by these people and putting up tarps so that... You know, your beginning of Act 3 should be so different from the beginning of Act 1. It's it's just a stark night and day difference. Like, literally, often you will see the beginning of Act 3 start. Uh, you know, it'll be a we'll be in a daytime shot and we'll cut to night or something. Like, if you watch movies, you'll notice that sometimes it's even as literal as day to night. Yeah. No, that's a really good point, actually, mm-hmm. how they did that. So, I mean, I, I agree with you, Sam. I think it was more interesting to not go to a different location. But I think that's why you see in other films they go to a different location because that's usually how Act 3 
starts. Because it's easier. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Because it's easier. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. So I think w- the one character we haven't really talked about is Gertie. Drew oh Barrymore. my gosh. She's and I've, I've figured a national out, treasure. Yes. Here, here's the job that she had to do in that movie. She was an emotional amplifier. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She took whatever the mo- emotion was in the scene and just exploded it. And that moment where where E.T. is crashing and they bring out the defibrillator and they zap him and immediately hard cut to her weeping. Yeah. And it just amplifies the emotion. And she mm-hmm. was so perfect. Damn. I also liked her sassiness. Like, sassy yeah. little Drew Barrymore is so great. Also, like, a phenomenal actor. At like yeah. what? She's like four that's or five. All, all but the that's kids, kids were so good. Yeah, yeah she was I, six. During that documentary, Spielberg talks about like specifically directing that scene that you're talking about with Drew Barrymore, and he was saying mm-hmm. like he would. I mean, the thing that's so great about I remember this when I you know even directing my movie like with a kid, their emotions like are just so there on the surface. I mean, just mm-hmm. right there, they will get into like believing exactly what you're telling them, and he yeah. would tell her like you know that et's dying you know what i mean and would like go through it with her and like get her in that emotional spot which takes two seconds because they're you know a five or six year old and their emotions are like up and down multiple times in a minute you know (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i think like the the story was that he kind of had to convince her that it was just he wasn't dead like it's just a scene in a movie afterwards was the thing i know i know but uh, but that, it was such, it's actually just such a great choice to have a character in the script like that because that is what little kids do. Like they do amplify every situation because everything's yeah. so <laughs> much bigger to them. So if you need that like kind of like that best friend role, like that person that's gonna you know mm-hmm. um, punctuate everything, you know, and give mm-hmm. it that little bit, you know, she's gonna be the great character to do that, but in a way that's also believable and endearing and funny in a very natural way. Yeah, totally. So <laughs> directors don't work with kids, but writers write a kid in there. <laughs> yeah, you can sell any emotion you want in a scene if yeah. you make the kid have the emotion. Well, yeah. I think she's making the argument that kids are easy to direct. Actually, it's, yeah, it depends. I mean, I got really lucky, and granted, I did something kind of different where we had auditions for the kids, and I actually it was funny the Madison who who ended up getting the part. I think was like my second audition, and I auditioned a lot of kids. Mm. Um, But on the callbacks, I auditioned them and then I took them out and I brought the parents in and I interviewed the parents. And that was the thing because I was like, I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere. My first time directing kids. I need parents that I know aren't crazy and are going to work with me. (laughs) And I get a sense of how the kids are as people based on how the parents are. And it was amazing because there were straight up some kids that I was like, oh, absolutely. (laughs) That's where you're coming from. Absolutely not. Like you're not going to, you'll make my life terrible. But Madison, um, was phenomenal and her parents are like the nicest people. So she was the easiest on set. But that's the thing is like, yeah, kids are really, I mean, as long as they're not in their head and you know, you create a good environment for them. Mm -hmm. What's so funny, kids these days that are actors, they're professionals. Like, Mm -hmm. they are machines. It's (laughs) insane. If they've been doing this a few times, they're like, I know my lines. They were better than the adults half the time as far as (laughs) professionalism goes. It was crazy. But it was only the kids that had the crazy parents where you had to be worried because of just all the, you know, BS that they throw on them all the time that kind of clouds them from just, you know, being a kid and acting. Before we completely wrap this up, can I ask you guys a question that's been bothering me from the beginning of this film? How how often did your parents walk around in robes while your friends were over? Because that was <laughs> weird, right? That was weird. I mean, it was late at night. Like, they were probably uh-huh, having a sleepover. Uh-huh. No, I, I don't get your know. point there. It feels a little it. inappropriate. I think with a mom with a like a house full of boys. Yeah, I would it was see. A little weird. Yeah, if it were like you know her daughter had a bunch of girlfriends over and she was like you know, no, I see that now. I yeah. see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I see that. Well, that's what I'm asking is like, was it, was it just like more acceptable in the eighties? My parents never did that, but I don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it when, doesn't seem weird to me. Yeah. The way I grew up, like we were the house that had the open door and you never asked, you know, mom, mom, can Joey come over? Can Megan come over? Can you, you know, like they just came over 
And like, like they part just of the family. Yeah, and like if kids wanted to play, they just like open the front door to see if we were busy. You know, I mean, so that was whether my house the mom too. was clothed or not. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that was <laughs> and, my house too. But my parents didn't walk around unclothed. But like I don't know. late at night, like it was not uncommon, to, like every weekend, to have somebody staying over, and like you got to live your life. And it, I kind of got that sense that it was the same situation there, like. These kids were just over all the time. And the mom was like, Ugh, I'm just like, it's not a special occasion. I'm just living my life, being myself. Mm-hmm. Plus, I'd throw out that we grew up in Napa. And even even the least nice parts of Napa are still pretty bougie compared to yeah. some other places. So- <laughs> Brett, yeah. Brett, you, you be- know my parents. <laughs> they are not bougie at all. <laughs> I brought it up more as a joke and not as a serious issue, guys. Oh, no. I'm, like, legitimately thinking about this. I was like, yeah, no, that could never be done today. People would be, like, calling that out. And oh, yeah. And being like, wow, she's taking it. Like, this is inappropriate. Da, da, da. But when I watched it, I was like, I think because it's never pointed out. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's never like, oh, we're playing up the fact that these young boys are hormonal. <laughs> and there, they're going to look was, at this mom, you know? There was the moment where, like, she bent down to the... Uh, the dishwasher and the one boy was like faking like he was going to poke her in the ass. Oh, that's the yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The, the one that really I noticed was when she hit one of those kids. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah. It uh-huh. wasn't much, but just a little swat on the head. And, and it wasn't even her son. Yeah. But no, she hit. but that's like how it, but that makes sense though, because yeah, if you're in that time where yeah you've mm-hmm. got this open door policy and you're kind of like the mom and kids yeah. come over and like parents parent like it takes a village kind of thing i mean i remember in my family which we moved around a lot but even when i was in when i lived in australia and like my family was a big italian family it doesn't matter if it was my aunts or uncles or like close family friends i was disciplined by whatever the whoever the adult was Mm-hmm. You know, it wasn't just that's like, oh, that's Italian. not my kids. Yeah, but it's so yeah. I'm kind of like I was used to it, but I don't think that would be something that you would see today. No, right. being like normal yeah. behavior. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a a different time time yeah. frame. Yeah, the little things. I do miss the the days though, like like you were saying, Sam. Like w- when I grew up, it was like we would just. You know, you didn't have a cell phone, so you didn't call to see if your friends could hang out. You just, like, show up at their house, and we would show up at their houses. And now, like, if someone just showed up at my house, I'd probably be pretty, like, like, weirded out. Like, what? This is my home! Like, couldn't you just text me first? Like, at least text to make sure I'm, like, wearing a bra. Just could you please, you know? Yeah. If you show up to someone's house unannounced, like you just have to wear the astronaut outfit now. Yeah. 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 It just has <laughs> to be. Climbing through the window. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I yeah. work from home, so like 90% of the time I'm like not even, you know, wearing real clothes. Oh, yeah. so like the delivery people come and I'm like, n- my hair is not done and I'm just like open the door like Nosferatu, like hello. <laughs> <laughs> Humans. Yeah. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah. So should we get some final reactions to this thing? I had one more scene I wanted to talk about. Okay. The the bike scene. Um we kind of went the trick bike scene with the obvious (laughs) the obvious BMX guy. No, I'm yeah, like that whole scene. The whole sequence. The whole sequence, but mostly like the ending. Um I mean this is not a realistic story, but I feel like from the time that they introduced the alien to that point, like it's pretty grounded, you know, like there isn't a lot of supernatural stuff that happens. And then just having them fly up is like just a little bit of magic. And I really liked Mm. how it kind of introduced like that little kid sense, you know, like I remember being a little kid and like jumping off of the top flight of the stairs and like jumping off the bed and hoping that I would just float and like fly. (laughs) And it really like created that little sense of wonder that I really. And they set it up really well with the clay balls in the beginning. Yeah. It makes fly. Oh, Mm -hmm. question about that scene. So I think I missed, I don't know what if I missed was something. going on. Yeah. I'm like, all of a sudden, like Elliot screams and then he yes. looks out into yes. a light and I'm like, did he have an epith? Did he have an ep- we don't see what he sees. I, I had the same question. I was like, what is going on? And then the yeah. brother's like, what is it? And he's like, something scary. And I'm like, what, yeah. what, it, what yeah, are you I talking like, about? I'm not is even that remembering the moment? that. It's, yeah, I, 
it's the guys outside scanning the forest. Oh, maybe. So what they, is, he's like scream. connected, I guess. Yeah. There was a like, sound effect that. Yeah, way. there was. There was. I think it was intercut before that that they were kind of near the house scanning, like in that field. So I, I think it was. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Sam. So I think that's what they were reacting to is they they caught a sound or they heard something of those guys outside looking for ET, and it scared. I just him. would have been so enthralled with the balls floating. In my room, I probably wouldn't have noticed. No, I totally agree. The very distant scanning outside in the dark over the hill through my window. Yeah, but then it it really felt like the DP was like, "Look, look, the lighting's really good. If you just come up and stare at this light bulb, so give him a motivation. Just (laughs) go stare at this light bulb because this lighting is amazing." Yeah. Well, I think the idea is that. Like, Elliot doesn't hear the sound first, but E.T. hears the sound, and they're emotionally connected. So he feels startled because E.T. feels startled. So That that may be it. Mm. Yeah, I think but that also, was like at a time it, that it wasn't it, clear. Yeah, it was, it was kind of yeah. a little bit of a plant, and then we didn't quite know what was going on. I think also part of the issue is there were a couple of times where that kid— like, I think it's an editing issue because the mm. kid reacts to stuff before it happens. Yeah. So just like the umbrella part with like E.T. opening the umbrella, the kid like reacts to it before E.T. reacts to it. And it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and I think it's just like an editing thing. Like if they had yeah. had the kid react after, it would have made more sense. Did Cooper e. and I kept laughing. kids react videos? <laughs> oh maybe yeah yes. there you go <laughs> this is the introduction of it you no know, cooper and i kept laughing like during these little editing moments and we'd just be like oh carol like who's the editor <laughs> yeah which i was oh, great carol. i was like oh yeah we both have female editors yeah. on our films but like these random the jump cuts too like before they yeah fly, and they're riding the bike so like it, it, oh, it was yeah. so funny you know yeah I mean, they're, they're great for the style and tone of the film but sometimes i was just like Look at that editing. Yeah, it, it <laughs> was it. it was very funky. Like yeah, like yeah. you said before, the bike started flying up, and they just cut and cut and cut. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. why? Times. Boom, why? Boom, boom. why? <laughs> or in the cornfield where they just cut like all these different angles, different or... angles. Yeah, that was so weird. <laughs> A little weird. Yeah, yeah. that's great. It was that's interesting. Great. So, Brett, what did you think of this thing? Your final judgment. It's the final judgment. Before I say whether or not I ultimately thought it was good or or bad, uh, I had this thought while we were watching it. Do you guys remember the never-ending story? Oh, no. Yes! Brett, Brett, Brett. Why would we not? Nobody committed suicide in this movie. (laughs) No. I did. I love it. I think it's brilliant. I'm just saying. Oh, no. They're on the bikes, <laughs> running from the cops. The shotgun comes out. <laughs> and then they float and off. And then they all float uh, off. Oh, oh, They're super dead. Uh, They're super dead. I love it. And they I'm, all float into the forest together, and his mom's there. And you know, it's, it's this whole wait, thing. They die. The never-ending story. Is that the one uh, with Noah Hathaway? I'm just looking Betray at the you. No. So that's Older two years after E.T., Next wow! Episode. So what what you don't know is that Brett has a theory that the never ending story is really that the kid just dies up in the attic. Yeah, I think the kid, and, at the end of that, that movie, the kid killed himself by jumping off of the roof of the school, and oh, then the, and then Game the final sequence style. is him mm-hmm. dreaming that he got revenge on the bullies in, while he's dying. That's it's like deep. a Birdman ending. That's deep. Yeah, <laughs> that's real deep. Don't don't tell him it's deep. Don't. It's not no. <laughs> shallow. <laughs> don't don't support this. You know what? Everyone but you guys fucking loves that theory. Okay. So. I love it. I love it. I'm on board. I think it's hilarious. Uh, but that said, uh, damn, this was this was a good movie, guys. Um, uh, and aside from it, it, it was weird watching it because I, you know I'm bad with timeline, and I was like. How early in in Spielberg's career did he do this? Uh, because because of things like the the, the crazy jump cuts and the and the mm-hmm. uh, uh, it, it, uh, the reused shots that I noticed, and I was like, what what is what is this? And then and then looking, and it was like Jaws and Close Encounters and and you know Indiana Jones, and I was just like, whoa, this is crazy that this is so far down in there. But like, 
aside from uh, just a couple of rough edges on the, on some of the stuff, like this was a fantastic story. The, the puppeting on ET was amazing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We didn't even talk about that. Like I felt the, the personality and, and what he was feeling and you know, that's hard to do with, with puppets. Uh, it had a, was, do we know anything about the, Oh, don't squeak the thing dog. (laughs) Do we know anything about like the the puppet team for this? Did we do, do any talk about that? Because I had this thought that it felt really dark, crystally. <laughs> oh yeah, it it I, does feel weird. I, I think some of it's a guy in a suit, and then close ups are amazing animatronics. Yeah, it's animatronic I, as well. I think somebody had this unbelievably brilliant notion that. If you make the eyelid the eyelids blink very quickly, you've got the a character. Eyelid. Mm, yeah. You know, that worked, man. Yeah. If the you make the eyes real. work, you've got a character. Yeah. Yep. I mean, look at I mean, Wally, which I feel pulled a lot from this film. The yes. character only really emotes through his eyes. Yeah. So you're mm-hmm. absolutely right. And I feel like it worked because they didn't try to oversell his <laughs> movement. They knew the puppet's limitations, and they kept it very, like, limited. IMDb says the puppetry was performed by a 2-foot, 10-inch tall stuntman, but the scenes in the kitchen were done using a 12-year-old boy who was born without legs, but was an expert on walking on his hands. Okay. What? What? Wow. (laughs) That's interesting. Yeah, a trio of actors brought E.T.'s other movements to life that's that is what i'm getting the first voice was spielberg himself oh. Look at us go. <laughs> and it, it reminds me of the thing we didn't really talk about but i kept thinking who is this guy you know on, on his own planet on his own crew who is he yeah and if he is a, a, an old scientist you know he's like in his 60s or 70s and he's the plant expert on the ship then everything that we saw in the, this movie makes sense because he moves kind of slow. He's got a wrinkly face. Like, if this is just <laughs> an old science dude, the puppetry, it works perfectly. He doesn't have to be fast moving. Yeah. yeah. I just took it as that was just because they all moved the same way. Sure. That could be um, it, too. And I'm like, just making ob- shit obviously, up. Obviously, <laughs> though, obviously he's like... The one that always wanders off and like, oh, God, yeah. where is he? Or, also, can or we talk he's about the, the guy fact that, that stops them... to appreciate what's happening? Like, yeah, maybe. You guys are on this mission, but look at this. Yeah. I thought E.T. was probably more like his species is uh, the character that Jason Manzoukas plays in every show uh, where he just gets off the ship and it's just like, Oh shit! A forest and like ran off. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's how I thought. Yeah. And then I also thought like when the kids like stay, et stay, and he's like, "Oh, you're cute. I want to go home. Um, a home, a home up there. That's yeah. a nice view." But yeah, yeah. really, yeah, like he he speaks English perfectly fine, uh, but is just so <laughs> wasted for most of the movie. They're just like, uh, "Et uh, phone home." Uh. Yeah, he's just an old drunk guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the alien from Patrick's book. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, our friend Patrick Edwards wrote a book about a drunk alien. Isn't oh, that's it? funny. Oh, it works perfectly. ET Part Two. ET the R rated version. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. and can we talk about how them calling him ET is the equivalent of him calling them human? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're just like they're like alien. I love yeah. you, alien. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Naming your dog, dog. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> or puppy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, IMDb also says, because you were talking about the eyes, Nick, that the young actors found the E.T.'s puppet's eyes were too far apart to comfortably look at him mm. in the eye. Ooh. So huh. they had to choose a single eye to look at. Yeah. That yeah. makes yeah. sense yeah. for when they yeah. first, the first time you see E.T.'s eyes, really, like when he's brought into the kid's room and they mm-hmm. really like... It's so much of it's in the shadow, so you're only seeing one eye. And then they do the over-the-shoulder shot with Elliot, and you see E.T., and it's really like you see half of him, but it's the first time you really get to see his eye. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, one eye. One eye E.T. So is that all your your thoughts, Brett? Oh, yeah, that wraps it up. I, I, I loved it. It was awesome. Uh, and I feel like 
more than anything, I'd, I have like more questions about you know the the, the puppets and the the different yeah. stuff. Sam thought uh, uh, Harrison Ford might have been in the movie. Uh, oh, I just... <laughs> there was a guy that looked like him, but that wasn't him. But he actually was in the movie. But they cut his scene. What? Yeah. What? what? Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Like, there's just so much deep stuff about this movie that i could keep reading and talking about but uh, you know it's it's good if you if you're listening to the podcast go watch it again it feel good for a bit (laughs) and you talk about how scary it is like the original idea was a horror movie really pieced together from a bunch of different during the writing process Mm -hmm. that makes a lot more sense because it's fucking scary in the beginning man like i can i'm still shocked like I th- I even think like a seven year old kid today would be scared, but I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe they've seen worse things. Mm. So Sam, what did you think? Uh, I love this movie uh, still, yeah. and like it, I think what shocked me the most is that out of all the movies we wa- have watched on this podcast, I think this movie is the one that I've watched the most like a child. Like, Mm -hmm. it just brought me right back to watching it like a kid. And, like, I just loved it. (laughs) And I wasn't expecting it to, like, feel as deeply for it as I did. Like, I was like, oh, it'll be good and I'll appreciate it for cinema because I've been to college now. But I was, like, (laughs) in it. (laughs) You know, I I was feeling everything that I was supposed to just like I was a kid. And, and and it was great. Was your heart racing like mine in in that final bike chase? Scene? Oh yeah! The music kicks in. You're just like, oh my god, this is perfect. Yeah, like, oh damn, that's good. Like you know, you just like you feel like you're the little kid like running with them and like get away from the cops. Yeah, you can do it. Like it's just it's brilliant and totally holds up. There's there's funkiness as there always is, but there are so few movies that get that emotional reaction you know so i'll i'll echo that and and you know there was something i said when we watched superman like somebody said did you watch it as a kid and i said i'm 40 years old i watched it last week and i watched it as a kid yeah that that's how you have to watch these movies and if you can successfully put yourself in the state of mind of the intended audience which is a seven-year-old and it's just a masterpiece and yeah it it fulfilled my expectations that just that still blows my mind because i just if i was 7 this movie would still terrify the fuck out of me like i don't in parts, i don't feel and that's that good. way it's it's supposed uh, to uh, not not in the good way that you you're saying no yes. like in the way that i would have stopped watching the film and not continued watching it cuz i would have been so scared yeah. but i was a i was a scaredy kid like i couldn't watch dark crystal and all this stuff but like i said before i don't ever remember there being a time when i hadn't seen et like i still watched this as a scared kid and i loved it like yeah i don't i think it's like it is scary, but I think they do a good job of giving kids a sense that it's okay. Like, it's not I, a dangerous world, you know? I, I think I'm speaking above my pay grade when it comes to child psychology, but <laughs> I, I think there's th- this idea that my child is too young, so they're going to be scared and traumatized. But I think the philosophy should be, my child is very young, so they're learning about how life is. Yeah. And this is an opportunity to learn about what death is and learn about, you know, learn about threats in the world and, and how to tra- deal with children trauma just too. learn about it. Yeah. Yeah. Trauma is yeah. inevitable. And so many people, I think, try to, you know, again, it's one of those things. It's like, how can you shield someone from the inevitable? Is that really doing them a service instead yeah. of being like, hey, let's let's use the training wheels. And like, that's this one of the great things about movies is it's a safe way to do that, you to, know, to and be it's something introduced you can always revisit. To yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just think, I think Iron Giant does the same thing without totally. being overly scary. You know Is what I mean? Is it the animation, though, that makes it less scary? No, I think, I think it was a, a tone that they set up in the very beginning of this film. Yeah. That really made it feel like I said it, it was shot like a horror film in the very yeah, beginning. A little, a little you know? Haley Joel Osment, Sixth Sensey, <laughs> yeah. Hornfields. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that. 
that was like, as a kid, like that scared the, you know, like the children, the corn stuff, like anything with a corn field, like, man, I would just, I would have been out. There's no way I would have kept watching this movie. Iron corn is the scariest veg way more emotionally crushing than this ended up being. Yeah. Yeah. It was Mm -hmm. like, that's, that's feelings that are, Oh, that almost seems more not inappropriate, but just like harder for kids than this than the the fear of aliens well, I think, in this movie. Like, I think you guys are talking uh, about like I think we're about. talking about different things because like I I agree that you know we should give kids this chance to like emotionally intelligently grow. I'm just saying that the the straight up camera angles shot choices and oh, yeah. sound design yeah. make it scary. Yeah, and I don't think any of us disagree with you on that. It's definitely scary. But I think it's it's done in a way that feels less like a horror film and just feels a little more real. You know, like walking to go get a drink of water in the night is a little scary as a kid as opposed mm-hmm. to like there's a real threat, you know? Yeah, definitely mm-hmm. had that like perceived threat feeling throughout mm-hmm. a lot of the movie. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I even felt that way about like the Goonies when they were yeah. straight up kidnapped, yeah. you know, and held hostage. Oh yeah. And I thought they were going to die. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah. you know, like that was just the thing about family movies back then is they really took pieces from other genres and they didn't shy away from the possibility of like kids be- being scared because mm-hmm. You know, they weren't afraid of parents not letting their kids see it because that wasn't really a thing that you had to worry about back then, I I, I assume. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's also the cool thing about it is that, like, yeah, you're, you know, just like any movie, you are going to have some kids that they're going to be like, I'm too scared to see it, mm-hmm. you know? And maybe yeah. they, will, they will see it when they're older, you know? Maybe they'll show it to their kids. They'll be like, oh, my God, I never, you know. I think that's the cool thing is they do hold up and they there there's that nostalgia from so many sides of, like, I was too scared to see it. Then also, like, oh, my gosh, I loved this movie as a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Ash, did you have any other final thoughts on it? Um. Yeah, I guess I'm going to break some hearts. I <laughs> thought this movie was just okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, nah, it's uh, good. I thought... Uh, I definitely, I don't remember like 90% of this film. So it was kind of like seeing it for the first time. So I didn't have like any nostalgia attached to it. And it, it in my opinion, didn't hold up in several ways. It felt like kind of cheesy a lot of times. Uh, And like I start, when I, the movie started, I actually really liked the beginning of the film. And I liked that scary horror sort of vibe that was going. I love the... The fact that we're like always on this long shot and we're never seeing E.T. up close really for very long until he's actually in his room. And and I like that, that there like builds up the suspense and everything. I think there's lots to like like about the film, but there were a lot there were just so many things that were like so cheesy to me that didn't hold up that like made it hard for me to become emotionally invested in the film. Like I said, like, I I was just, like, laughing at times that I think I wasn't supposed to be laughing. Um, So for me, I didn't really have, like, a big emotional impact uh, with any of the characters or E.T. E.T. still creeps me out. I just think he's weird. (laughs) It's still weird to me. Like, the character design. Yeah. and And I remember that really bothered me as a kid. And it's still like, I never was like, oh, I like this character because he's just too weird. And like the way he moved when the kid was like outside with his flashlight and he like comes walking up towards him is so just alien and strange. Like to me, movement is like the scariest alien thing, which you don't get from CG anymore because CG characters move so fluidly. Mm -hmm. Um, But like... So I just, I don't know, I never really felt, like, attached to E.T. that that much. Um, so you think, I just kind of felt like it might, was okay. This might be the uh, premise of the podcast thing where, like, the the modern viewing audience might might see more of the flaws than the nostalgic paints. I do, our, yeah. Our and I think it, it unfortunately, like, it's enough to take me out of the emotional impact. But that being said... I mean, you can't argue that, you know, that the direction and cinematography and filmmaking, like, is not good in this movie. It definitely is. It's just 
there's some things about it that I didn't really find held up. And it's not really a movie that I feel like I would want to watch again, personally. I don't know if it's so much like the modern viewer as it is an age thing. You know, like when you see things as a kid, they seem more real because you're just, you're that naive. You know, like you go to Disneyland and you think the pirates and Pirates of the Caribbean are real people and not animatronics. I think it's a mm-hmm. similar thing. Like we we know it's not real as an adult, but we remember how it made us feel as a kid when we thought it was real. And then having watched watching it now without having that backstory, you know, and especially somebody who looks at, you know, effects and does their own VFX, like you're looking at it through that lens. So you see I how mean, these don't look real. I actually thought the visual effects were pretty impressive and held up really well. It's more the storytelling that I thought was kind of cheesy. I get that. I, I yeah. can totally see that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I totally agree that it's uh it's funny, like, you know, I watch it now and I, I look at that as just, oh, that's just part of it. You know, that's yeah. part of like nineteen eighty two filmmaking. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like again, like I watched Sandlot not too long ago because we were in a hotel and like there was nothing else on. And I was like, this movie has flaws. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just straight up, there's cheesiness to it. But I think that's the thing that, yeah, it, it, that's also too what separates you from a child viewer for, versus an adult viewer is like when you're a child, you lead with your emotions so much more. Yeah. So yeah, that's like what ties you into things versus when you're an adult, you definitely feel something emotional, but you also have this, your brain kicks in, you know what I mean? And you're mm-hmm. like often thinking, well, would I do that? Is that how mm-hmm. I would see it? You know, like, so you often are using a more like logical point of view along with your emotions. Totally. Um, so I think that's kind of like, yeah, I, I feel you there. Which is interesting. Cause like, I wonder if, because you all s- saw it as kids and remember those feelings, you're able to tap back into that as opposed to I'm viewing it without ever seeing it as a child. Well, I'm sitting you know? there Absolutely. wondering. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh no, go ahead. I was going to make a joke. Uh, <laughs> okay. I was just giving it like an absolutely, like a what, what kind of Drew Barrymore as a little kid punctuation yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, I'm just wondering if like what you're implying, Ash, is that, you know, when this movie came out in the theaters, parents were leaving with their kids being like, what, was I supposed to care about that alien? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe, I don't know. I didn't really care about the alien. Sorry. Uh, and that's i i mean it's interesting that you brought up goonies because goonies is another one for me that i didn't see as a kid and when i saw it as an adult i didn't have the connection and the love for it that most people who have this nostalgia for it have um and yeah and so it, it, it this this movie really did remind me of goonies in that same way and same sort of vibe but um, I think there's still amazing filmmaking going on in here, you know, clearly. But, yeah, it just didn't, it didn't really, uh, it wasn't name. like my favorite. I don't hate it, but it just wasn't the so, phenomenal thing that I think it's yeah. always cracked up to be. Yeah. So, Paulina, let's let's get your final thoughts on it. You picked it. Yeah. <laughs> Are you glad you picked it? I am. I'm I'm glad I picked it just cuz like, you know, especially when you go back to these classic movies, even just from a reference point of view of, you know, you see just how it inspired so many different films and also too how you can take a pretty basic story structure and it still just can work. And the thing like I completely agree with everyone's points, you know, um I look at it now and I I laugh, you know, just because Mm -hmm. of that cheesiness. But the thing that really makes E.T. stand out for me is like when I watch it, I feel like I'm watching a movie, like I'm going on a ride. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about it where it's like, this is a movie. It's not supposed to be realistic. Spielberg's so good at setting a tone. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. I appreciate that because I'm like, you know he made really bold choices, you know, (laughs) um, and really ran with it. And I, I feel like, I I just feel like I'm going on a ride, you know, which is a lot of fun because oftentimes it's also why I love shape of water, you know, last year so much too. It's like when I watch, I feel like, Oh, I'm watching a movie. I'm watching something that's crafted. And there's something about that. That's just nice to fall back to sometimes, you know, like I love everything that also pushes those boundaries of realism a ton, but I also just love that feeling of being like, I think just the nostalgia of watching something that's 
what it means to watch a movie uh, Mm -hmm. is a lot of fun regardless of the movie, you know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. It it holds up for me. It holds up for me, but I'm very aware of its flaws and I love it. I love the flaws. It's really interesting. This, (laughs) this thought of the, the ride of the movie, uh, because we've brought up similar kind of like, I think it's the same concept that we've talked about before, but haven't really put it in that way. And it almost seems like, uh, I don't want to say uniquely a Spielberg thing, but he does it so well. He really does. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And that's why I was saying, like, you can't deny that that his filmmaking, you know, he, he, there's a reason why he's considered a master. And you can tell in this movie, you know, for sure. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So, Paulina, if we're uh, looking for updates for Mail Order Monster, are you uh, putting information out on Twitter? Do we just go to the website? What's what's the best way to stay up to date? Yeah. Um, so website is Mail Order Monster Movie, Facebook Mail Order Monster, Instagram Mail Order Monster. <laughs> um, if not, find me. I will point you to Mail Order Monster. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to get all the updates there. I mean, the best way is to go to the website and like we have a little newsletter sign up. And I'm just I don't spam anyone's inboxes, but uh, I'll be giving the updates on like one, when the trailer will come out two when you can pre-order three, when it comes out. Um, like I said, we're going to be at the Portland film festival. Uh, when we do have our release in the U S there's also going to be a really cool place. You can find it in 2019, Mm -hmm. which I, I just can't say it now, which I'm like, I've been telling (laughs) everyone, which is terrible, but then our, my distributors were like, you really just can't tell people. (laughs) Like you kind of just like, you kind of just have to wait. And I was like, "Ah, exciting stuff is still coming. Yeah. Exciting stuff is still coming. Um, yeah. And like I was telling you guys earlier, we have our, I loved the music from ET so much. Like that was such a big thing for me. And, uh, our composer really pulled a lot from that genre, not from the movie as much, but from that genre, we made an original song. It's been nominated for best song. Wow, so, and great. Lily Kershaw, who's like a really great singer songwriter. If you ever look her up, she had a new EP just came out. She like did this song and she was incredible and all this stuff. But so you'll be able to find it on all these different people's socials as well. Do you have the dates of the Portland film festival? October 22nd to the 28th is the festival. My screening dates I have not been given yet. Happy. Okay. But I'll make sure to let you know. Yeah, we'll broadcast yeah. it. Very cool. Cool. Well, so thanks for joining us, Paulina, for uh, for ET and, and suggesting we watch ET. It was a good time. Oh, thank you. I had a blast, you guys. This was a lot of fun. And yeah. I'm, I'm very excited to see Mail Order Monster. If you like the show, this is part of the Last Dash TV Network content. It's this podcast and a YouTube channel. Uh, where there's a drinking show, video game parodies, and a lot of other fun stuff. Yeah, and uh, this project that Nick and I have been working on, the the behind-the-scenes series for it, is finally releasing. So by the time you listen to this, it will have released. But it's called, the the behind-the-scenes series is called ZomCom Diaries, and I take you behind the scenes to show you how we made it. So you can find out more about that project at Laughstash TV on YouTube. And you can also follow us on Twitter. We're at Laughstash TV. Or you can follow this podcast specifically if you know <laughs> if you don't like the other Laughstash TV, I guess. I mean, whatever. I guess it's cool. But you can follow this podcast at Let's Rewatch. And uh, we do fun stuff like we do movie polls where we let you pick the movie or like today I tweeted a picture of the film. The first one I tweeted was too hard and nobody could guess it. So I tweeted a second one and then several people got it correct. Uh, Let's see who it was. So the first person was someone named Vero, then Harry, Harry E. Nutt. Oh boy. (laughs) Buck, uh, Mitch, Jimmy, several people got it. Um, So congratulations to you. So if you liked our podcast, please follow us on Stitcher or Google Play Music or now Spotify. Spotify. Yeah. Follow us on Spotify and tell your friends. We'd love to get more listeners. And leave a review. You told me not to say the leave a review part. uh, Just on iTunes. We need some more (laughs) reviews on iTunes. I want them. I want them in there. I want the stars. Give us those stars. Gotta review them all. Review them on. Cool. So make sure you check out Mail Order Monster. And thanks for joining us for this episode. Uh, And make sure your podcast feeds are up to date. Tell your friends. We'll be back in another two weeks for more Let's Rewatch. 
Yeah, next time uh, <laughs> the James Bond series is dragging the, the, the bottom of the barrel here, we're going to watch License to Drive. Wow. <laughs>